Good morning, Parazul Church, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And if you're joining us for the very first time, we warmly welcome you. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Before we get into a time of praise and worship, let's take a look at last week's teaching. Well, we were talking about the shakings that align our hearts with God's heart. And how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is allow the shakings to refine us. And then we allow the shakings to draw us closer to God. And then finally, we allow the shakings to open a door to share Jesus Christ with others. Well, let's worship together and be blessed. Indeed, Heavenly Father, we recognize that you are enough. And Father, as we go through times of difficulty, we go through times of shaking when the world around us just seems to be crumbling. We thank you that we have a solid foundation that we can base our lives on. We thank you, Father, that in the midst of all of the shaking and the struggles that people are facing, in the loss of loved ones, in the loss of opportun uh, employment opportunities, in the loss of businesses, Father, in the loss of the ability to be able to go to your graduation or when your vehicle breaks down or it's been damaged or burnt or something has gone wrong, we thank you that even in all of those difficult times, you call us to be steadfast and to be to be focused on you. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to give us the strength to do that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, good morning, Pottersville family. Can I invite you to take a seat? Thank you so much for being with us. For those of you who are joining online, we really do appreciate your presence. And we just pray that you will continue to encourage other viewers around you by, by sharing comments as we go through today's sermon. So last week, Pastor Kevin was talking about how that we are on this journey, that it's a time that's difficult on this, on this road. We need to be steadfast. There's going to be shaking. There are going to be hard times all around us. We looked at Acts chapter 8 where after Stephen had been stoned, there was a persecution against the church so that all of the believers actually left Jerusalem. But those, except for the apostles, the apostles stayed behind in Jerusalem, but the rest of the Christians went to different places. But wherever they went, they preached the good news of Jesus with them. And we see their travels. That was really amazing lesson that encourages us in the shaking to make sure that we align our hearts to God's heart. And so today what I'd like to talk about is shaking the shaker. You see, if you continue in Acts chapter 8, you see Philip doing incredible things. He is going to go into Samaria. He's going to preach to the Samaritans over there. Then he's going to go south on that road that goes down to Gaza. He's going to meet the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's going to baptize him. That man is going to go on his way rejoicing to establish a church in Ethiopia. He then goes to Caesarea. And people are just moving to different places. A lot of people, a lot of Christians are even trying to get completely out of Israel because the persecution is just so difficult to deal with. And the Apostle Paul, at this stage, his name is Saul. And Saul is really out to get at the Christians. And as we think about that, and as we think about the experiences that he's going through, we need to recognize that this, for us, is a good time to draw closer to God. There was once a man who wanted to do exactly that. He thought, man, it seems like God is so distant. Let me, let me see what I can do to, to draw close to him. So he went to a monastery. And in this monastery, it was one of those where you had to take a vow of silence. And in all of the silence, he was lucky that people were given an opportunity once a year to be able to say something. And I think they looked forward to that day when it was their turn to speak. And at the end of the first year of being in the monastery and it was his turn to speak, he said, the soup is too cold. Well, after another year of absolute silence, he got an opportunity to speak and he said, we need salt in the food. He waited another year. It was his opportunity to speak. And he said, that's it. I'm leaving. 
And the monk who was next to him, he forgot about what he had intended to say for that year. And he looked up and he said, I'm not surprised. You have been complaining ever since you got here. And there are three things that I would like us, or three morals that I would like us to draw from this story. And the first is that salt is always better when it's in the food rather than in the container that you keep it in. The second is that, you know, monastic situations are good. Where you have an opportunity where you can draw yourself away from the world and you can be in the presence of God and you can concentrate on that. That's fantastic provided that there's a purpose for drawing close to God. That in the end, it's going to prepare you for going into life and to make the Jesus difference in this world that God has called us to make. And then the third thing is that we who are Christians are the salt of the world. And so we should expect that there is going to be a time of shaking because that's what happens to salt. It gets to be shaken. And as we think about that and as we think about how we need to draw close to God, I I want us to consider the conversion of the Apostle Paul from, from Saul to Paul, the great evangelist, the great apostle. As we think about that, I'd like us to remember our mission. We have a statement at uh, at Potter's World Church, a mission statement that says we want to know God, that we want to be his people, that we want to value others, and that we would like to change our world. And let's see how that happens in the life and in the conversion of the Apostle Paul. We need to know God in the shaking. And how do we get to know God? Well, I'll start off by considering that perhaps Saul, with all of his religious zeal and his desire to do the will of God, didn't really know God. Because Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 says, But Saul, still breeding threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And it really is sad to see an educated religious leader who's got incredible zeal, but he's blinded by his zeal because he does not know God. He knew about Jesus and the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. He knew that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. In fact, Among the religious group, their desire was to actually go find Lazarus and kill him because many people were believing in Jesus on account of Lazarus still being alive. And they wanted to kill Jesus as well. Saul was aware of that. Saul was aware that Jesus had been crucified. That he was put in a tomb. That they had put a huge rock in front of that tomb and that they'd sealed it in. That they had asked the Romans to come and guard that place. But that three days later, that tomb was empty. He knew that. He knew that after the death of Jesus and after the day of Pentecost, that there was a commotion in Jerusalem that caused 3,000 people to go down and to be baptized. He knew that there was a time when a person who was a beggar at one of the gates of the temple, he had been lame from birth. He got up and he walked into the temple. He was leaping. He was praising God because something incredible had happened and that he was claiming that it was in the name of Jesus that this miracle had taken place. Saul knew that. He knew that the people who healed this man in Jesus' name had been arrested, that they were put into prison, that they were told not to speak in the name of Jesus. He knows that in, they continued to speak in the name of Jesus. They got to be arrested. They got to be put in jail. And that when they were supposed to be brought out for the trial, the guards went out to bring them in. And this was their report. We went to the prison cell. We found the jail securely locked with soldiers standing at the doors. But when we got in there, the cell was empty. And while that announcement was being made, somebody else came and said, hey, the people that you're looking for are standing in the temple courts, and they are teaching people about Jesus. 
Saul even knew that Stephen, in his dying breath, looked up and he says, Behold, I see the Son of Man at the right hand of God. And when they were stoning him, he said, God, please don't hold this sin against these people. But do you think that knowing and and, and seeing all of those things would change his mind and, and would have him stop and rethink this? It happened to Gamaliel. Gamaliel was Saul's teacher and he was saying at the trial of Peter and John, Gamaliel was saying, people, let's leave these men alone because this could be from God and if it is from God, we will not be able to stop it. But Saul wasn't satisfied with that. He decided that he was going to go on his way and he was going to persecute this church. He had the letters of authority and he was going to go out. He chose Gamaliel to be his teacher because he wanted the best teacher in all of Jerusalem, the best rabbi. He was a great student. He was one of the most incredible students for his age at that time. He was top of his class, but he failed theology. And there was something about his situation that Jesus had spoken into that he was going to realize. Perhaps not at this point, But Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 15, he says, you know, Isaiah was right when he prophesied and he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain because their teachings are just the traditions of man. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 14, Paul is talking about his experiences as as one who is dedicated to learn the will of God. And the power of God, he says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many people of my own age. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But in all of that, he wasn't able to get his heart to be aligned with God's will. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we see one of the reasons why something like this can happen. Because when he's writing to the church in Corinth, he says, you know what? The problem is that whenever the old covenant is read, there is a veil that covers people's hearts. But when they turn to Jesus, the veil is taken away. So sometimes if if we're looking into theology, but we don't focus on Jesus in the way that Jesus makes God known, we're going to miss the picture. In fact, in John chapter 1, in the prologue, John is trying to help us to understand why Jesus came to the earth. And among the many things, one of the things that John wants to achieve is for us to know who God is. And it begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and that Word was God. The Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the the only begotten. And then in verse 16, He says, And from the fullness, we have received grace upon grace. I like the way the NIV puts it. He says, we have received one blessing after another from the fullness of God. He goes on in verse 17 and he says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. In other words, he is saying, if you really want to know God, then you need to look at Jesus. Jesus is what God would be like if he had flesh and bones. And so as as we remember that part of our mission is to know God, we need to recognize that we could miss who God is if we're not looking at the way that Jesus lived life and the way that he related to people. Jesus is full of grace, and he is the truth. And when we see Jesus emptied of his divinity, taking the form of a servant, becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross, and then looking down at people who are murdering him and saying, Father, forgive them because 
they don't know what they're doing. We need to recognize that God is a God of love. That even when we live as his enemies, he wants the best for us and he will continue to do whatever he can in order for us to be able to get that best and to be able to receive his love. And as we think about that, I'd like you to watch this clip where Saul is going, he's he's on his way to Damascus and his journey gets to be interrupted. There's this bright light that comes down. And as he sees this light, he hears a voice. He hears the voice of Jesus. And Jesus just says very simply, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which he responds, who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Here is a point. Finally, Saul is at the point in his life where he can recognize he does not know who God is. All of his studying and all of the effort that he's put into his pursuit to be this incredible Pharisee set aside to do the will of God, all of that was for nothing. He still doesn't know who God is. And to recognize that God is love, When you look at the way that you're living your life, if your life is about hurting people and destroying their lives, then that is an indication that you haven't met God. You don't really know who God is. There was one time a person who wanted to write a song. He was moved by a sermon and it was on the love of God and he wanted to write a song entitled The Love of God. And when he was looking for inspiration for the song, he found a translation from a Hebrew poem. A poem that at one stage had been written on the walls of an asylum in Israel. And for him, that would be the third stanza of an incredible song. And it was something that that happened, the, 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 the writing on the walls of the asylum took place in the year 1096. That's over 1,075 years ago. But hear the words, they're amazing. It says, Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. We have a hard time understanding this incomprehensible, vast, incredible love of God. And so we need to look to Jesus to get an idea of what God is like and to try to emulate him so that we can live like people who know who God is. But we also need to be his people in our time of shaking. We need to be the people of God. In Acts chapter 9, verse 9, it says that after this conversion experience for three days, he was without sight. He neither ate nor drank. And I believe that this time of fasting and repentance was a valuable time of reflection for Saul. And I think that if we want to apply it to our lives, as we go through the hardships that we're facing in this time, 
the things that are happening around us, the way that COVID is changing our lives, how we're losing people that we love. We're going through times of sorrow. We, we're facing economic crises, and, and it really is a time of shaking. Maybe it would be a good time for us to just slow down and reflect. For Saul, it must have been really hard for him to think about what he had done. He had persecuted the churches of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly uh, grief produces death. And so as we think about that, and we think about what is godly grief, it's when we can look into our lives and recognize the things that shouldn't be there, the things that are wrong, And we can go through a process where we realize that if I want to become a child of God, I need to believe God. And then I need to acknowledge that there is sin in my life and repent of that. And repentance gets me to the point where I say, I want to do things different. I want to live a different life from what I've been doing before. And for Saul, it's a good time for him to reflect on the unwavering faith of the Christian people who help him to understand who Jesus is. And as he thinks about them in their situations, that they are willing to lose their possessions. They're willing to lose their freedom. They're even willing to lose their lives in order to be be able to remain faithful to the faith that they have in Jesus. He's thinking, here are people who understand what it means to be faithful even to the point of death so that they can receive a crown of life that God makes available to those who are his people. We want to be his people. The shaking sometimes makes us close our eyes to be able to see Jesus in a better light, to see him in a way that we've never seen him before. And sometimes this business of closing our eyes is what allows us to see more clearly. And when we're in that position of prayer, we find that it brings a level of spiritual clarity that we really need and that will take us on to the next phase in our lives. We need to be willing to be the people of God. Just as much as that was the case for Ananias. Saul is going to become a person of God. Ananias is a person of God and he he has to help Saul. It's very difficult for him because God appears to him in a vision and says, Ananias, I want you to go to Saul. He's praying. And Ananias is not sure that he wants to do that. From the reports that he he has heard about who Saul is, what he is like, and what he does to Christian people, that's not a place that he wants to be. But he does. He goes ahead. He's obedient. He goes to Saul. He teaches him about Jesus. He even baptizes him so that he will receive the Holy Spirit. And Saul then goes into a place where he can learn about Jesus all over again from the beginning. So in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15, he talks about how after he had been converted, he says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who had been apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and then returned to Damascus. He had this incredible privilege of being able to learn the gospel from Jesus himself. Special time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about an experience that he has. He doesn't know whether he was in the flesh or out of the flesh, but he says, I was taken to the third heaven, to paradise, and I saw things that people are not allowed to be talked, uh, that people are not allowed to talk about. And he says, because of the abundance of these revelations that I've received, I was given a thorn in the flesh. But as we think about that, and we think about this time where he can have special, dedicated time to think about 
where his life is coming from and where he's going, there's a change that takes place within, and he is going to become a child of God. His life and his heart are get, to be, get to be changed. I suspect that here is when he has this vision of heaven and he sees what God is offering to those who are his children. And as we think about a passage in First First Peter chapter 1, Peter is describing the same thing when he begins in verse 3 and he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born of a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He goes on and he says, We are called to an inheritance that is imperishable, it is undefiled, it is unfading, and it is kept in heaven for you. You who by God's grace are being guarded through faith for the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. God has got something that is more precious and more special than anything that we have to give up in this time of life. He's got that. And he wants us as his children to be heirs, to inherit all of this so that we can just have this glorious existence with him. We need to be careful that we're not looking for the things and not the one who is giving the things because God is offering us love. And the things are going to be totally meaningless if we don't have love. And so let's be his people because in being his people, there is a reward. We, we get to be called the children of God because that is the manner of love that the Father has given to us. And once we become his people, there's another change that takes place in our lives. We begin to value others. As you think about valuing others, I want us to go back to the conversion of Saul and think about something that Jesus asks him. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it's good that Saul isn't terribly argumentative at this point in his life and he's saying, I haven't been anywhere near you. What are you talking about me persecuting you? He's not going to argue the point. He's going to recognize. In as much as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you have done it unto me. That the people that we meet as we go through life are God's children, whether they behave like it or not. And that if we are doing things to either harm them or benefit them, God is recognizing our actions. And he wants us to value people. He wants us to treat every person that we we come across as somebody who has been created in the image of God, who is a child of God, and perhaps needs to be redirected on the homeward journey. And Paul comes to recognize this. And one of the things that he's really, really concerned about is the Jewish people. He is a Jewish person himself. And when he goes out evangelizing, he'll go to a synagogue first, find the Jewish people and try to convert them. And then if they don't listen to him, he goes to the Gentiles, he's back on mission, the mission that God has given him. But here's what he says in Romans chapter 9. I have to read it slowly because he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. It's surprising for him to say this. He's he's had a vision of what heaven is like. And then he says, For I wish that I myself could be accursed and cut off from Christ. For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, those who are related to me according to the flesh. He says, they are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. God intended that for Israel and Israel didn't get it. And he still wants them to get it. He says to them belong the patriarchs 
And from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ. Okay? In other words, he's saying Jesus is a descendant from the family line of people in Israel. He's from the tribe of Judah. But, but look at the way that he describes Jesus. He says, Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Just recognizing that if you want to know what God would look like if he had skin, you've got to look to Jesus. And these people, they've had Jesus come through their genealogy, through their religion, their scriptures. The promises were made to their fathers and they're losing out and he's saying, oh, what I wouldn't do for those people to have a change of heart and to be able to accept Jesus as their Lord. You know, sometimes as we go through life and we think about the blessings and it's possible for a sense of selfishness to overwhelm us and for us to think that, you know what? If there are fewer people, there'll be more blessings for each one of us individually. But that's not the way that love works. Love is so completely different. When, when you try to keep love for yourself, we have a word for it and it's not a nice word. We, we, we call a person who loves himself excessively a narcissist. Oh, and people who love themselves are dangerous people because they hurt those around them. But the thing about the love of God or just love in general, we've experienced this, is that if you want love, the best way to have a life that is full of love is to take all of the love that you've got and to give it away. And the thing about the promises of God in eternity is you will enjoy eternity most if you will just offer the gift and the hope of eternal life to every person that walks into your sphere of influence. Paul was able to recognize how important it would be for other people to have this incredible gift. He wasn't selfish. There was a time when he'd been on these missionary journeys and his life was hard. It wasn't like he could go in and preach to people and then say, oh, right, we'll we'll accept the gospel. There were people who were just like he had been, Jewish people who did not want people to turn to Jesus and to believe in Jesus. And so he would be beaten. There was a time where he was stoned and dragged outside the city and left for dead and the Christians came and revived him. He got up and he He didn't say, well, that's it. I I think my preaching days are over. He said, where's the next time? If these people are not going to listen, let me go and find other people who are going to listen. And he continued in his preaching. And on his way down from, from one of his missionary trips, he ends up in Caesarea. This is where Philip, who had gone down into Samaria and and, and baptized the Ethiopian, he's living there. And, And Paul has come to his house. He meets his family. He's he's got these four daughters. They have the gift of prophecy. They're an amazing family. And while they're there, there's a prophet whose name is Agabus who comes to their house and he does something strange. He goes up to Saul and he takes Saul's belt and then he ties his feet and he ties his own hands. And he looks and everybody's watching him. What's this? And he says, the Holy Spirit has told me that The person who owns this belt is going to be bound like this by the Jews in Jerusalem and they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles. And when they hear that and they know that the reason that Paul has landed in Caesarea is that he's on his way to Jerusalem. So they say to him, Saul, please don't go. Do not go to Jerusalem this man is a prophet and what he's saying is going to happen to you if, you if you do that. And Saul's response is very, very Christian. He says, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus And Luke says, since he could not be persuaded, we ceased and we said, the Lord's will be done. That was the heart of Saul. 
He had become Paul. He had seen something that was greater than the value of anything that is in the life that we go through here on earth. He didn't mind any of the things that he had taken away from him because he had a higher calling and he knew what God was calling him to. He was on mission for God. Yes, he went to Jerusalem. When people, the Jewish people saw him in the temple and recognized him, they almost tore him apart limb from limb. It was the Romans who came in. They stopped the commotion. They protected him. They almost took him into protected custody. And then he realized that if he tries to speak to these people, they're not going to listen. In fact, he heard that they had a plot, that there were some of them who were taken a vow not to eat or drink anything until he was dead, and they were going to see to it that he was dead. And he heard that. That was the point where he decided, okay, if he's going to be tried, it's not going to be in front of the Jewish court. It's going to be an appeal to Caesar. But even as he appeals to Caesar and gets to be taken to Rome on account of that appeal, his life is difficult, but he's always willing to preach to the people who will come into his sphere of influence, even in the prison situation. Festus was hoping to get a bribe from him to set him free, but he got a sermon instead of a bribe. Agrippa, listening to him, wouldn't accept that. In fact, Felix says, while Agrippa is listening, Felix says, Saul, you're just raving. I think your great learning has made you mad. And he says, no, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. And he turns to Agrippa and says, Agrippa, you know these things are true. They didn't happen in the dark. You've experienced, you've, you've heard these reports. You believe, I know you believe the prophets. And, and, and Agrippa says to him, Paul, in such a short period of time, are you trying to make a Christian out of me as well? He says, not only you, I wish that everybody who's listening to, be, to me would be like I am except for these chains that bind me. He just wanted people to be God's people. And not only to be God's people, but to change the world. We need to change the world around us because of the hope of the gospel. But... The idea of changing the world is like a daunting task. You know, I'm so small, the world is so big. What can I do? It reminds me of a story of a little boy one day who was out on the beach very early one morning and he saw that the tide had receded, that there were a lot of starfish on the beach and the rising sun was going to kill them. And so he decided that he was going to save the starfish. And he was picking them up and he was throwing them into the ocean. There was an older man who was walking along who said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm saving these fish. Can, can you help me? The man laughed and he said, nah, what you're doing isn't making a difference. There's so many fish. You can't make a difference. And he picked up one of those fish and he threw it into the ocean and he says, it makes a difference to that one. I think that as we go through life, we need to recognize, you know, I may not be able to change the world around me, but I'm a part of this world. And when I change, the world is different just because I've changed. And that if I can have influence on people around me and the more the people who change, the greater is going to be the difference that we make as we go through life. I'd like the worship team to please just come up. And I'd like us to recognize that the Apostle Paul was just one man. He had incredible zeal and, and, and he had drive. And God was able to see that and just turn it around and channel it in the right direction. In Romans chapter 1 in verse 15, he reflects on all of what he has, the missionary trips that he'd been on and how the power of God is able to bring about the change. This is what he says. He says, therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what, by what I have said and done. 
by the power of signs and miracles and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. I think that we who are the people of God should be like scribes. That we should take our quills and drain the ocean by each one of us being a testimony of the love of God as we come into contact with people. And the story that we write will be our own story of how because God loves the world so much, He changed me. And He made me a vessel into which He could pour His love so that that love could filter out into the lives of the people that I come into contact with and that we could change the world that we live in because of the love that we have for people. And if you haven't decided to be a part of this family of God that He invites you into, that He wants you to be an heir of, then there's this number that's on your screen. If, if you would pick up the phone and if you'd call that number and, and somebody will speak to you and help you to become a child of God so we can know God, that we can be His people, that we will value those around us and we can change our world. Our worship team wants to sing a blessing over you. And in this time, if there's anybody who would like to just receive that blessing, I ask that you just stand up, that you even come to the front here and we just bless you and allow God in this shaking to move you into a different area. You receive His love, you receive His Spirit, and you receive the joy that comes through that. God bless you. Thank you.